And thank you. I'm honored to be here. I don't know if you guys know this, but today is uh, the United Nations International Day of Peace. So uh, I wanted to acknowledge that. I also wanted to acknowledge the um, ancestors uh, on whose land we uh, occupy right now and um, that we remember that. Um, my presentation's about this eco-social design from micro to macro. I'm gonna try to rush through it and give you guys the, you know, the, the mini version of it. It's, a, it's an actual full-length workshop that takes up to a weekend uh, to get through and there's all kinds of layers to it as there is in life. And so um, we're just gonna kind of look at it from the, from the uh, outward perspective and then work a little bit inward. And then, and my hope is at the end that we can actually start looking at some of these patterns and applying them to our lives and our interactions. That's, that's really my goal, you know? And um, you know, the question of this whole thing is like, is the current paradigm of the American dream uh, all of the creature comforts that we have become accustomed to killing the planet. And if you've been here at all today, you recognize that this is a no-brainer, right? We're less than 4% of the world's population, and we're consuming 50% of the world's energy, producing 50% of the world's waste. And, and it's an absurdity to think that we can sell this model to the rest of the world and have them dream the way that we're dreaming. So what we need to recognize is that... Um, we're out of balance and that we need to rebalance that and that the majority of that work is going to take place at zone zero uh, with the self. You know, we, we like to point a lot of fingers at fracking and coal and did a, but the built environment, the city that you live in all over the planet is responsible for 60% of the problem. All of the trucking, all of the infrastructure, and then the worst utilization of it is the individual, right? You at home, in your car, your toilet, your refrigerator, and your power are all um, not uh, done with the most efficiencies in mind, right? And 70, 80% of the homes across this country are low-performing homes, uh, not going to even reach pass, uh, uh, lead standards, let alone passive house standards, right? And so uh, we really need to, as individuals, start working towards uh, coming up with solutions at Zone Zero with ourselves, our interactions and behavioral practices at the home and within our community. It's gonna, it's gonna have to change. Starbu Starbucks cannot be the norm. It cannot be the norm to our future, right? $25, $35 a week, you know, 140 billion straws a day, right? Uh, these are absurdities. We, can't, we cannot allow that current paradigm to continue to exist. And we need to recognize that an unbalanced ecosystem is unbalanced at both ends. And those stressors, no matter how complex and intelligent of an organism you are, will end in your demise. You know, we, we all know that Mesopotamia, once known as the Fertile Crescent, is now desertified, right? And nobody talks about that there used to be lions and tigers and hippopotamuses and elephants all interacting in those waterways. And now, there is, now there's not much life at all. And it's extremely difficult uh, to even exist as a human who can adapt to most extreme environments. And so um, this climate issue is going to become a real big problem for all of us. And it's going to affect every single aspect of how we live. And the only thing that we can guaranteedly do is invest in each other, right? If we as a community grow collectively together and we have infrastructure in place that in the midst of emergency, we can navigate that emergency without making mistakes, without pointing fingers, and without ending up in a lot of the same messes we have. So we really need to be uh, cognizant of that. Um, and mid, amidst this uh, age of individualism, um, you know, it, is, it, it, it has been intentionally designed for us to be in this moment, in this period of scarcity. But we know from 500 years ago, first contact to this continent, Turtle Island, that, that this continent had an abundance, right? It was an abundance that changed the world that we live in. 
We do not live in scarcity. 7.6 billion people on the planet growing. We are thriving as a species. We do need to reorganize, and that's where my hope lies, right? That a small trend, 3%, 8%, 10%, and it's happening on a global scale. America is not leading the charge. America is not leading the charge. 600 billion trees already planted in India in the last year and a half. And it's happening all over the world. Other countries are rising up. The state of Colorado has made some, uh, set some goals for it, but we need to organize. We need to start taking action and we need to start doing things intentionally to offset our footprint, both in the home and in, in our community, the things that we love, right? Going up into the mountains and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about who I am and what I do. Um, you know, my name is Michael Agazar. I'm an integrated system design specialist and consultant for in-action climate mitigation brokerage. Um, it's a social entrepreneurial agency that focuses on creating sustainable economics through the intersectionality of eco-social design and environmental restoration. The, and, and I work with private entities, nonprofits, and for-profits. Um, I'm, I, don't, I don't shy away from any opportunity to uh, repair or restore a distressed area. And, um, and, and I just really, it's really what gets me up every day. That's where I'm hopeful. You know, I know that, uh, you know, every tree I plant is making a difference. Every heart and mind that I touch is making a difference. Every child that I set on a pathway towards living a life differently and thinking instead of egocentrically, thinking ecocentrically, I like to call it, um, that I'm helping future generations be mindful of that. You know, we talk about what is permaculture. You know, I don't know if you've been to the website, but you know, a lot of it's based around people, planet, prof, uh, uh, fair share, and uh, and those are permaculture principles. We, we all know why this is necessary. I'm going to rush through that. And um, what do we need to do to solve the problem? What I do, I'm going to go a little bit more in depthly into that. And then, what can we do to collectively organize to maximize our impact? That's the real goal of why. I'm here today. I'm not a big conference person. I'm a doer. I'm an action. I like to have the shovel in my hand. I like to get people organized and get excited about it. I'm not go stand in a march and hold a sign, although I've done it. Uh, I'd much rather be out there in the trenches actually doing the work and making change physically to the environment that I know is going to have a long-term lasting effect. So the history of permaculture um, was formalized by this uh, professor, Bill Mollison. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him. It's only been about 40 years ago, 50 years ago, that uh, he came up with this uh, philosophy. And basically what he had studied was, studied was a lot of indigenous practices all over the world, primarily in Australia, uh, about land management, right? And he just intentionally opened it up and created this archetype which you know um, brings us here today. Um, I like to think of it as an intentionally an intentional design science based on the ethics and principles set forth by indigenous wisdom, and formalized by Mollison. Um, and it's conscious design, uh, maintaining agricultural productive ecosystems that are diverse, that are stable, that are resilient, uh, and and these are patterns that we see in natural, healthy ecosystems. But we know in this period of mass acceleration that we are at the highest uh, point of ecosystem collapse in the last 10,000 years, right, since the last ice age. So we really need to start thinking about this. This is the uh, foundations of, of permaculture, right? The ethos is Venn diagram. Uh, it's, it talks about the social, we're all shooting for the sustainability. But in my last 20 years of studying this design science, I would say that most of the time, uh, this Venn diagram is very fragmented amongst the, amongst the uh, permaculturalist world. But it's just an archetype, and our goal is to hit this center and be sustainable. Right, and so we need to keep on giving it the old college try, not give up on it, right, and creating opportunities for us to get it right. And and so, I do my best to stay grounded in this ethos in every decision that I make. Right, I'm thinking about what's best for the planet, what's best for people, and how do I create a fair uh, and just uh, economic opportunity out of it, and then 
um, how do I perpetuate that forward with the people that I work with, right? And so you take that ethos and then you have these uh, 12 uh, principles that are part of your design toolbox that you go through, right? I'm not gonna go in depthly to them because there are 12 of them and boy, they, but what I like about them is that each one uh, has to deal with thinking about the other one and they're all grounded in the ethos, right? That makes sense. So when you're thinking about uh, catching and storing energy, how do you want to think about it? You want to think about it for, from the perspective of what's best for the planet, what's best for people, and then fair share. So, and then how this all works is there's this permaculture flower, and it has these seven domains, right? Seven petals, right? And so then you take those ethos and principles, and then they spiral outward. Nice pattern that we see in nature. And uh, they touch all of them when you're making your decision and design processes so that uh, you can incorporate them into anything that you're doing. And so, so far, like I said, over the last 20 years, I've utilized this archetype and uh, I have yet to find anything that we need as humans that doesn't fall under these, the domains of these permaculture failures that we can't fit and ground into these ethos. But like I said, it's, it's a relatively new design science and so it's growing and changing and dynamic, which I appreciate it, uh, uh, about it. And what I'm uh, learning from it is that, you know, there's a lot of baggage that came with the colonialist mindset into permaculture and the indigenous mindset as associated to indigenous knowledge. And they are starting to find some intersectionality, you know, Rel relatively long, uh, young. So I'm hopeful that when those two things better align, that we'll come up with better strategies and solutions. We all know that it did not take science for people to exist on this continent for 14,000 years. It took best practices and common sense that was passed down multi-generationally and done by observations and interactions by a regionally appropriate on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Like those are what gave you uh, the good solid foundation to know that if you do it this way, that it will be there for future generations to come. You know, un unfortunately our European ancestors, um, uh, they uh, exceeded their carrying capacity first, uh, and that means that they had an unbalanced equation of the number of people to the uh, uh, amount of natural resources that they had, and their solutions led them on the pathway to where we are now. Um, but in this age of information, we have time to drastically change, to drastically change and look at things different moving forward. So this is um, a, a Lakota symbol, right? And it talks about these four things. This is one of the indigenous things that's different, but this was passed down multi-generationally. It has to do with, um, with earth, with water, with air, and with fire. And fire is representative of energy and inputs. Entropy, I like to think of it as, you know, how do you create a yield and stuff. So it's a little bit simpler pattern, right? And, but, it, but it's kept in this vision of these, of these um, seven tenets, the, the Lakota medicine will. Um, and uh, we're thinking about seven generations and we're honoring 300 generations, that, 300 years that, had, uh, that existed before us. And we're also thinking forward about 300 years when we're making our decision. So you could see how these seem uh, um, philosophies can be applied to permaculture, and I often do uh, in my work in, in the community. And um, uh, it's showcased here at this Osiri uh, 2018, and you know next year it'll be 2019 because we just finished our convergence up there, um, where we worked on these things as a community. Um, so this is one of the great patterns, right? This is one of the great patterns in nature. You can see this bioregionally across the planet. Okay, it's called a food forest, right? It has these seven layers. Now, bioregionally, it's gonna look different from Colorado than it is gonna look from Haiti or Costa Rica or something like that. But it's gonna have these seven layers of plants working together in a harmonics, right? That creates the opportunity for it to be regenerative. And if human interaction is to amplify these harmonics, guess what happens? You get food forests that are basically the Amazon rainforest, right? 
right, where you have a bioregion that's designed for human interaction and where people um, take plants that they've identified that are necessity and they propagate them by increasing the edges and over time maintain a surplus. A surplus that is so abundant on Christopher Columbus's first contact in his diaries on Haiti, he wrote, life was deafening. I mean, th th that's just, out of, the, out of his whole memoirs, this is one of the things that just profoundly stood out to me most about this man. You know, I, I understand that he was a victim of his circumstance, like we all are, and that at that time period, what he was doing made the most sense. But um, to him, this was a, was, a, like a, like, was a bad thing, like life was so deafeningly. There was so, like, look at all this free stuff, right? You know, and not recognizing that the Arawak, the Haino Arawak people of, the, of IT Island, you know, they lived there, why? Because it was the most abundant bioregion of the Caribbean. People don't know this. But Columbus came to Bahamas, and then he moved, and then he asked, where's your leader? Big island that way. He got that out of him. And then he went to Cuba. Where's your leader? Big island that way. And then he went to IT. And then he met the king of the Taino people with all of this surplus and abundance, all this economic trades of goods and services that were being done through boats, traveling back and forth and exchanging uh, it and creating a stabilized economy that was so abundant that life was deafening. I was just in Haiti last uh, summer working on a, and I can tell you honestly, other than human life, uh, I didn't see a bird inland Haiti for um, the first seven, eight days. And I thought that that was a pretty scary and odd thing to think about having researched that. So if we work with nature and we promote these types of um, systems, right? And these systems happen naturally in nature, right? This is most likely the byproduct of animal interaction with opportunity, right? In Colorado, you're gonna see this in almost every valley system where water uh, collects, right? You're gonna have uh, naturalized plums and apples, right? You're gonna get the organ grapes and uh, you know nitrogen fixtures and, and um, and all of these plants working together that with just a little bit of human interaction, you could actually amplify and create a yield if you go see this pattern in nature. And there are several places uh, uh, along the front range where I do this type of work where I don't go tell anybody, I just go up there and I increase the edge and I come back every year and I see expansion of it and it getting better, erosion control is taken care of, right? More and more life, because I'm looking for that life is deafening, right moment where uh, my actions are reflected in a much more vibrant and resilient ecosystem. So uh, we get the same pattern in soil, right? Um, but like with my example with the Fertile Crescent, right? There, there, was my, there is uh, archaeological, uh, there is anthropological evidence of mycelia, of mycelia in the Fertile Crescent, right? None now, it's a desert. But when mycelia is allowed to thrive and humans interact with it appropriately, right, it, it can help amplify the amount of yields that the soil can give, up to 30% by having healthy, active uh, uh, mycelial network uh, going through, whether it be um, our forest here in Colorado um, or even in our plains, right? Um, uh, you know, a lot of it is based on... Um, of a lot of th different things, but we really need to uh, look at this example as an opportunity. You know, there are lots of patterns in the world that are based off of this, the models of mycelia, and the more and more we study it, we know about maybe 1% of what we need to know about it, and we know even, we're learning a lot about science of soil, but um, you know, there are 700,000 documented types of soil that fall into 12 phylums. So understanding that is an absurdity, right? But for me, when I go to any bioregion, the first thing I do is I dig a hole. I know what dirt's supposed to taste like, I know what it's supposed to smell like, I know what it's supposed to look like, I know what it's supposed to feel like, right? And my amenities are to find a balance somewhere within whatever extreme 
uh, equation I find in digging that hole. Okay. Right? We, we've all seen this today multiple times, right? This is the uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide, right? This is an, another huge problem for us, our waste, right? Our waste is a huge problem, plastic's absurd. Seven, um, seven trash islands in the Pacific Ocean, one of them the size of Texas. Um, you know, we need to start thinking about how we uh, deal with our waste. Colorado, you know, we pride ourselves on being environmentally friendly other than uh, upcycling of, um, of tin and, and, and aluminum, only 9% of, of what we send to the landfill actually gets recycled. We need to do a better job of that. And at home is one of the best places for you to do that. I'll give you some examples of how you can do that at home. Okay? So this thing happened in, in uh, 2016, right? Paris Climate Accords. My mentor, Eric Tonsmeyer, was there. He got to spoke, speak on behalf of Drawdown. Um, you know, all this great momentum came out of it. Not this perfect system, right? It was the 21st Climate Accord, and now we're working on the 23rd, and we're not going to even go to it as a country. We're not, we're not going to have any governmental representation at it, which is absurdity that there was 20 something of them before we got to this point, but hey, we'll take what we can get. Um, my point is, is that this is starting, and it's already happened, it's, it's already a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, the carbon economy is, it's blowing up across the world. Countries, banking, all this is organizing around it. So we, we need to start thinking about how we're gonna organize around it. Uh, it even though we've opted out, Colorado is still uh, chosen to move towards it, but we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan of what that looks like. United Nations came up in 2015 with the 2030 agenda, the 17 different things that they said uh, were the sustainable development goals for the world, you know, uh, and number one is, is no poverty. Um, you know, I, I, um, I question, you know, why climate action is 13. Right? I, I don't think we understand the s severity of this current circumstance that we're in. You know, I know we heard this morning that it was 25% of fisheries were gonna be affected by the coral collapse, but I've been studying this for a while. And globally, it's more like 60, because uh, majority of oceanic fish use reef systems for, for uh, propagation. That's where they have their offspring to, create, to have the biggest opportunity to, to keep on living, and, and we're, not, um, we're not even cognizant of that. Now, life will find a way, and, and they're finding other you know, um, ecosystems to adapt to and stuff like that, but some of them can't adapt to it, like salmon. You know, salmon has a really hard time. You put a dam in its way, and you can basically kill an entire genetic strand of salmon by doing that. So we need to be cognizant of that. Um, so one of the projects that I worked on last summer, I talked about a little bit, was uh, in Haiti, Yon Se Lamu. Can you all say that? Yon Se Lamu. Yon Se Lamu. And now you all know some Creole, Haitian. It means one love, one love. And you know, and uh, in, in Spanish, we'd call this uh, corazón, right? Like really deep, 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 deep love. And so Yon Se Lamu, has been working in Haiti since the earthquake. Uh, we partnered with about three other organizations to do a, um, a permaculture project with Village Mosaic and a couple of orphanages and a couple of farms. And we had about 50 farmers, about 700 orphanages, orphans, and um, about 300 young people at a, at a uh, primary school, and uh, in the 10 days I was there, we planted 600 trees, started four nurseries, started uh, 10,000 seed starts, and it's a year later, everybody's still extremely excited about it. They're increasing the edges and growing more food and creating more opportunities for them to move from annual production uh, to perennial production and get into perennial economies, and it's all, it's 24 yields that'll be staggered throughout time and throughout the year, you know, so there's a 30-year plan for the mahogany, 
you know, there's uh, immediate plans for the mangoes and the avocados and stuff like that. And so they're getting more and more interested about it. And, you know, it was a super, super tough experience for me. I'm not a hot weather person. And to go down to Haiti in June and work with all those people in 100 degree temperatures with no relief, you know, there's, it's not like you could take a break from it. It was tough. It was really tough. But I was, I, you know, I'm stronger for it. I feel really good about it on this day at the um, uh, Martin Luther King rally. I was really honored to get to carry the banner uh, in the march and raise awareness about it. So if you get a chance, check out Yonsei Lamour. Greg Cronin is the uh, on the board of it. It's a, it's, a, it's a predominantly Haitian run board, but he's the local organizer here in Colorado. And so I was honored to work with him. Um, my project this summer was Green Labs Urban Education, uh, and it was showing my social entrepreneurial skills to design an eco-social design for the urban environment. And so I worked with uh, 10 young people to teach them about sustainability and urban agriculture this summer. We volunteered all over the city. We did about 500 hours of volunteer service, and these are inner city kids who you know, they thought they wanted to work in urban ag, but after, you know, a couple of weeks of pulling weeds, they're like, is this all we do? <laughs> so, you know, we diversified uh, the curriculum and uh, we worked on a lot of other projects that were important to them too. Um, and then lastly, the indigenous wisdom and permaculture skills convergence. This is the second year I've been honored to go up there and teach in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. Uh, to work with this economic revitalization program that is getting young people um, working on, on art and graffiti and teaching them about permaculture, giving uh, multiple generations of young people to interact with animal and livestock and bringing a diverse group of people. There was about 100 people there from all over the world. Uh, we had about six international people there, Paris, Spain, um, England, and um, Germany and uh, some, a couple international organizations and stuff like that get their hands in the dirt. And we did a lot. We did a uh, demonstration rocket mass heater. We did a uh, photovoltaic startup. We worked on some earth plastering and we started a Earthship project that we're um, hopefully gonna be finishing over the next year. I uh, encourage you to check it out. Come up next year if you can. Uh, hope to be a part of it again, be asked back again. Uh, it's a really cool product. My project, my contribution, other than teaching the decolonization workshop, moving from egocentric to ecocentric, is uh, riparian restorations and short prairie glasslands restorations. And so I worked with, um, uh, with the community in, in, uh, in doing that, and we put about 1,200 trees in the ground. So that was a, it was just a very beautiful experience. There are still people there. There were people, I just talked to a young woman last night. She told me she was leaving two weeks ago when the thing event happened. She's still there doing work in, in love with working uh, with the Ogallala Sioux people. And, and we, we have an obligation towards reciprocity with this. A lot of people don't know, but during the Great Depression, the Ogallala Sioux people were self-sustaining and they did not suffer from the depression. They had put the way they had designed the infrastructure of their community so that they looked out for each other and they had enough so that it wasn't an issue. There was not a lot of displacement. Unfortunately, jealousy because of that led to a bunch of, uh, of infractions by the government and sanctions and stealing of land and stealing of livestock and basically set them on a downward spiral that they could not recover from. And that is something that we as a community need to be very aware of because what I learned from Haiti is that normalized paradigm of existence can easily become the United States. Multi-million dollar mansions with entire shanties built around them and those neighbors do not know each other at all. And road infrastructures that were so bad like, I would rather drive on some of our logging roads than in Port-au-Prince because there's potholes that, you know, you could put a body in and things that you can impress your friends with, with monster trucks. And that's just normal. And every night, every day, everybody throws their waste into the street and you sweep it to your neighbors and he sweeps it to his neighbors and then they sweep it to the runoff 
and then somebody starts a fire about 10 p.m., 30-foot flames going into the air, hundreds of them all across the city, normal behavioral pattern, not just happening in Haiti, happening in Africa, happen and we cannot, you know, how can you convince anybody who's just trying to sustain life in the midst of a, you know, a serious circumstance that they can do things different. Like if you don't come with hope and opportunity, right? Because education isn't going to do it. Uh, you know, Drawdown says the number one thing we can do in the world is educate. Education without opportunity. I know for a fact that there are PhD professors walking across the desert right now as climate refugees, right? And, and, and we don't recognize there are 32 mass genocides going on right now as we speak all across the planet. People just killing people because of some different word, some different name, some different ethnicity, some different belief. But we have opportunity, like I said. I don't let that get me down. I look at the fact that it's only going to take a small amount of us to change the pattern, to normalize uh, uh, sustainable, resilient, vibrant communities. That's an easy sell, right? Especially if it's grounded in love and not fear, right? If it's grounded in love and people, people get uncomfortable around me all the time because of how loving I am and how much passion and it makes them uncomfortable because it questions everything as it should. Because as I said in the beginning, zone zero, you is the edges that need to change in order for us to move this thing forward. Because if you start doing things differently in the home and it starts being reflected differently in your neighborhood, when the whole thing collapses, I want to be standing next to my dear friend exchanging squashes or rabbits or chicken eggs while everybody else is running around saying the sky is falling and it really doesn't have any precedence on my happiness. So what's next? What are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to organize here in Colorado to do? I have a few ideals uh, as an inaction climate mitigation brokerage. The majority of my work comes from consultation, but as I said earlier, I really like action. And we have a big, huge beetle kill problem here. We have a, a huge deforestation problem because of that. We need to organize One Million Trees for Colorado campaign, right? Get a, get a tree into the hands of some young family members all across this state at a certain time, at a certain day, Arbor Day 2019, everybody make a pledge, make a commitment to plant a tree with their family and honor that tree for the duration of its life, right? This can make a huge difference in how we think, how we interact, right? Imagine growing up with that tree as a young person and every day from when it started to when it grows, right? Or have to suffer in the shortcomings of it not making it because of extreme climate change, right? We just had a pretty catastrophic event that just happened a couple days ago up in Fort Collins, huge hailstorm, right? and uh, wiped out a bunch of stuff. Um, I have some friends that work up at Turtle Island Ecological Center who are trying to do these food forest projects and stuff on the prairies, which is a little bit inappropriate, but they're trying. But their trees got torn up by that hailstorm. I mean, they just look terrible. They're just the bark shredded off of them. They're not gonna come back. And, um, and so we need to start thinking about what those solutions look like. Like, how do we bioregionally prepare for what the future is going to look like here, right? Right now, we're at three days on average over 100 degrees. 15 years ago, zero days over 100 degrees. Predicted 70 years from now, we will be adapting to 100 days over 100 degrees. Over 100, over three months. Like that will be normalized in the next 70 years. Imagine what that's going to do to our winters. We've already seen what our winters are doing, right? 33 days less of frost in wintertime, right? That makes for a very short ski season. Uh, tourism is a huge economic thing. So we need to start thinking about how we um, organize and come up with solutions. My Green Labs Urban Education Project um, I'm really excited about trying to put together a mobile lab, a mobile classroom to show net positive, like, you know, in a tiny house, 
that um, shows what totally off the grid uh, living lives like, low E, but have it produce enough energy that there's a surplus so that you could sell that surplus. That's one way to, to generate extra income, right? To have enough food integrated into it so that you can, you know, get 70, 80% of your food right there on site. And then the educational opportunity of it showcasing on that. So these are just a few ideals that I had. What I would hope right now is that I could just fill us facilitate a conversation with you all about what we need to do, why we're here, what you're passionate about, what I can do to help you, what you could do to help me. Thank you. Any ideals? Do we have a microphone? Yeah. Uh, but no person asking a question, so. Um. So at the home, while, while you guys are thinking about questions, at the home, so yeah. we've, we've talked about this. Your thermal envelope is probably the biggest thing that you can take care of. If you don't have insulation in your attic, this is probably one of the best investments that you can make. 70% of the energy is lost through, through, through the roof, right? So insulating your roof is something that you could do that can help extremely uh, cut that back. You know, um, your comfortable temperature, you know, I know people who keep their house at like 62 degrees just by raising it to 70, right? You're, you're saving yourself hundreds and hundreds of dollars, right? Your freezer, if you're not using it, like right now harvest season is coming, but we just came out of the summer when we're waiting to get enough abundance, right? It should be unplugged if you're not using it. Your refrigerator if you have a refrigerator freezer combo, the freezer should be filled to maximum capacity. And you should be increasing the thermal mass if you're not increasing the food. And what I mean by that is freezing water, right? Because that thermal mass will help that uh, freezer hold temperature longer so that the generator doesn't cut on as often. So you can save money there. I used to send my students home with that knowledge like, hey, you can save your parents 10, 15 bucks a month. And, three months you can now have earned a pair of shoes just by keeping frozen water bottles in the, in the freezer. And then in the summertime, you use those frozen water bottles to thermal regulate, right? <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a great strategy. I really don't, we got, we got uh, AC, we haven't had AC in our home for, uh, for a couple years and we got it this last summer because it just made sense. And, and our bill is coming in where we're actually right at net zero we it actually we got such an efficient system that we're not paying as much as we were for the fans and the cross ventilation and all the swamp cooler and everything like that we're paying about the same actually he said a couple bucks less so we're saving money there uh if you don't have a low flow toilet system uh you can throw a couple bricks in there right and displace water and and now you're saving yourself a couple gallons every time you flush um if you don't have uh, a gray water system and you don't know anything about it, you should be thinking about that. You know, water is life and it needs to be treated as such sacred. So I'm wondering if you would uh, be willing to expand a little on what you were saying, what society might look like if we right-sized our carbon footprint. Like what, what sort of systems or like, what would our culture look like? What would our systems look like? Well, if we lived in harmony with yeah. nature. I, I don't think that there's one uh, solution. There's going to be multiple solutions. Post-industrial age, what we need to recognize is the urban environment is obsolete. We, we moved to urban environments for opportunity to work in industry, right? Now there's no steel companies, so Pueblo's you know, falling apart. Okay? Uh, that's not necessary to live that way. Uh, 2,500 square feet uh, per per two people household. That's not necessary to, to live that way. We need, we need to start thinking about downsizing. I would like to think that we have a lot of surplus right now and that people are starting to move towards projects like Pine Ridge. That Pine Ridge project, I'll tell you, my five days there, I didn't want to leave. It was beautiful seeing people collectively organize and work at, at creating meals that were delicious, nutritious, locally sourced, right? 
uh, it was beautiful to see the skill exchange and how many people were hard working every day from sun up and sundown. And then my favorite part was us coming together at night and celebrating. You know, I got to hold a baby two, three times because this young woman wanted to dance with her husband. And, and it was just that she trusted me and that I got to hold this young little life in my arms while they had a good time and watch them, you know, be in love. You know, for me, that would be the ideal circumstance, right? We come together as community. We build these intentional systems that are designed to look out for the whole as opposed to the individual. Those with surplus recognize that that stratification is necessary. You cannot have mountains without valleys. You just can't. It's just a normal ecological pattern. People are going to have more than others, but we can't be conscious of what we do with that, that the privilege of being in a position of having more is not earned. It is a byproduct of circumstance. The status quo that they've always told us about is real, right? If, uh, me growing up in inner city San Jose, my brother being murdered on the streets, my cousins being murdered on the streets, my uncles, aunts, nephews dropping out of high school, that socioeconomic imprisonment is designed to keep those people imprisoned and oppressed to maintain the status quo. There, there's no opportunity there. And I know that if my brother doesn't die, I end up in the same circumstance. It's the only reason I'm in Colorado. I love California. I love the way I grew up and where I grew up. But it's just a romanticized narrative from my childhood. I did not grow up poor. I slept on the floor. I slept with 15 other kids. But my life was rich. And we had adventures and fun every day. And I never knew that I didn't have until I got mainstream, until pointed, people pointed out to me that there was this competition and that I needed all this stuff. And I just was very confused. Like, I don't need all that stuff. I don't need to be in competition. So my hope is, is that everybody finds what the world, how beautiful the world could be for them and works, to, works together to, to create that circumstance and bridge these partnerships, you know. The illusion of race, right? The illusion of race in America, right? We are one humankind. 2020, you're going to be asked to mark on your U.S. census who you are. And I want you to seriously think about not checking the white, team white box, because that's what it is. Because you will look right under that team white box, and the new one that they're putting on the census, they're talking about now, is non-white Arabic. What does that mean to you? What did it mean to you when they put non-white Hispanic on it? It meant that if you were a white Hispanic, you could come be on Team White. That's what it meant. They're recruiting for Team White to keep us divided. I, I ask you to think about the fact that we all suffer from the same affliction, the human condition, that you check humankind. You go right down there and other and you write humankind in. Quit playing their game. That's the world I look forward to. There are more questions for Michael. We can do that. We also have dinner ready now. Um, so uh, any, any more questions? Um, Michael, I'm going to be asking you how to put a gray water system in our house. So just add that to your List. queue of. <laughs> All right. Well, I think Thanks. the idea about uh, uh, planting trees here in Colorado and try to get that going would be a great action and maybe to a group of people to put their heads together and kind of make it, make it move forward with a lot of help from Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Uh, Everybody. Yeah, schools, yeah. And um, the questions that Michael was posing in terms of ideas are, are we're, we're so interested in your ideas and inspirations. Um, and uh, so, We'll go after me, Libby, and then um, we have Reverend Stephanie Price, and then uh, we'll go into dinner after that. Did I hear you say that you just hang out in nature somewhere and expand the edges just because you love to do that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful to, it's beautiful to do. 
And um, yeah, I just, it's, it's where I get my peace, you know, those moments. I, I didn't say this, but uh, I have had no greater love affair in my life than that with nature. She has, uh, she has given me, she's met every need I've ever wanted and given me so much peace of heart and mind in any moment, including the inner city. You know, uh, they call it uh, Silicon Valley now. But when I grew up, it was Santa Clara Valley. And I used to just run wild through those hills all the time to get away from that inner city mess. And it saddens me to know that I can't go back and run those hills anymore because they're all gated communities, multi-million dollar homes, and I'm not even allowed to drive up there, you know, to see. So that's sad, but, you know, the beautiful thing about her is that she's with me no matter where I'm at, so. Thank you so much. And on that perfect note there, um, uh, Reverend Stephanie Price, did I get it right? Uh, is a uh, minister at a community called The Land. And so maybe you can say a little bit about that. Yes, yeah, so dinner is ready. So this is the worst possible time to keep you. So I'll just be super quick. Maria had asked if I would talk about, um, in 10 minutes, hope, um, which I also felt like it was a setup because <laughs> I was like, oh, man, could I have a harder job? Like, um so, <laughs> I know that I feel the pressure right now. So, yes, I'm a United Methodist clergy person appointed uh, way out in southeast Aurora, um, responsible for 10 acres of prairie land that a faith community is growing on. And we've worked on this community since 2013, trying to get it through the city process. So there's all sorts of stories there. But there was a day when we were sitting out on that field under a tent. And each person that is in our launch team, all five of us, were sitting on the ground discouraged and brokenhearted and thinking that it was time to give up. And just down the road, a school bus comes driving and stops right where there is really nothing to stop at. And the door opens and a young boy gets out, maybe 10 or 11 years old, and with a great smile on his face, running towards us under this canopy tent, he says, I heard about you and what you're doing here. Can I be part of your family? This was a dream that I had, a literal dream three years ago that I hold on to in the midst of so much hopelessness and despair that exists in the world around us. And I share this with you this afternoon, this evening, to show you that even my dreams are filled with discouragement. <laughs> Aldo Leopold writes that one of the liabilities of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. Last Saturday, our gathering faith community was worshiping for one hour. Over that one hour, just across the street, Conoco Phillips, which had had these stakes, which is a bad word for them, but these huge metal poles going up in a giant square, just in the hour that we were out on the land worshiping and reconnecting to nature and recentering ourselves and what it means to not own but to belong to this land, they built an entire wall around the perimeter of their property. And as I stood there looking just across the street, feeling so frustrated that over the past five years, we haven't been able to build anything. These are my shallow hopes. They are personal and they are pragmatic. They are, will someone write a check for $100 and will each and every one of you invite friends and show up on Saturday? They are measurable goals set up for public, objectification, which one can choose either to reject or accept, but rarely claim ownership over. These goals, these hopes, these shallow hopes, they function much more like a rescue expedition to the permanence of uncertainty that surrounds us. But my deeper hope 
that hope where we creep off of the place where our toes touch the edge of the pool, an opportunity to sink or swim, or perhaps more importantly, a space to learn to float, and Wendell Berry's declaration to be joyful, although we have all the facts. This place, this place of deep joy and deep abundance creates a vulnerable space, a space where we have to hook ourselves into dreams of things that have yet to happen, a hope that is found in a perpetual act of surrender to victory, lest we forget the work we were first called to do, that our lives might be safe space in a world of latent landmines. My hope, my deep hope rests not in my ability to create change, but the courage that lives in the spaces in between us, witness through our courage to show up over and over again, even when the walls around us are being built faster than the ones we tear down. This is a courage of which none can claim ownership and so none can commodify. These hopes are beyond the ego's strangle. And my hope this evening, just as every morning that I wake, is planted in an unmarketable reality that values process over product, relationships over results, conflict over conformity. We, together, are spiritual CEOs of unfinished business. And today and every day, we commit ourselves and surrender to being present in an unfinished story, one of which we will never get to say the end. We together gather as a community of accountability to push one another further out into the deep end, persevering through that dream that in each day and every generation, the goal may be the courageous work to surrender control so that we may continue and call. And so this evening, as we prepare ourselves, I invite us to center, to center our hearts, our breath, to a deeper place, from our minds to our souls. As I pray, O oh God, who I call mother, O oh God, who I run to when I am tired and rejected and alone. O oh Spirit who surrounds me and reminds me that though the world is cold, you are warm. O oh body who gives me life, thank you for the nourishment placed all around me, that when I realize I am starving, you remind me that there is food to eat, a table that is set, and people that wait for me, so that in this brokenness I may be reminded that it is these jagged edges that guide me to the place where I fit in. And so, O oh God, spirit of my mother and my father, land that speaks to me in each moment through the wind and the sun, I offer you my gratitude for the responsibility you have given me and for the tasks that I reclaim as mine. Amen.